It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of November 22nd, 1991. And once again, we have a couple of really good movies to look at, some not so much, and then others that I have never seen before, which basically means a regular episode here. So let's go ahead and get right down into it. Let's start off with the first movie that we have here, the biggest hit of the weekend, and really one of the funniest comedies ever made, honestly. And that is, of course, Barry Sonnenfeld's The Addams Family. You know, this movie had one of those notorious production histories that more than more than not usually ends up coming back to hurt a movie big time in terms of its legacy. I mean, this movie was originally developed at Orion Pictures, but of course Orion at the time was fi was not making as much money as they used to. They were afraid that this was going to be another massive flop. Uh, the movie went over budget big time. There were rewrites during the shooting of the film. People on the set got sick. Uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, who was a first-time director on this movie after years as a cinematographer, uh, he was very stressful on this movie, which caused a lot of multiple delays. Uh, Orion really was financially struggling at the time, even though they were winning Oscars and all for their best pictures. But um, they were afraid that this was going to be another big budget bomb. So what they did is ended up selling the film to Paramount, who completed the film and handled the distribution here in America. But overseas, Orion still handled the financial, the international. Uh, distribution and um needless to say i think it's needless to say they made a pretty big mistake by doing that because they not only let go of a good of a really good movie they let go of like i said before one of the funniest movies ever made i mean this is a great great movie i love this movie so much it's a fantastic film it not only we brings back the the old school adams family from the comics that was missing for the longest time because the original TV series, many people forget, that was more of a family-oriented TV series. It was more meant for kids. Adults could watch it as well. They did that with the cartoons as well. But many people forget that the comics were really filled with a lot of black comedy and stuff that was clearly aimed at adults more than the kids were. And this movie clearly really worshipped everything about what made the Addams Family so special. And it just... It works on so many levels. I mean, Angelica Houston and Raul Julia as Morticia and Gomez are just perfect together. They're so great to watch. Their chemistry is fantastic. They have this macabre, staccato way of talking to their kids and the, the people around them. And it just, it works so well. They're just so great together on screen. This movie also has a great cast overall as well. You've got Christopher Lloyd as Fester Adams, who's, I was really surprised after years, after years later, after seeing the Back to the Future movies, and then also the, um, why am I forgetting it now? Who Framed Roger Rabbit? God, it's, it's stream of consciousness. Like you have to be right on the mic spine on. So, anyway, like I said, like when I heard that, that when I realized that that was Christopher Lloyd, the same man who was Doc Brown and also Judge Doom and Roger Rabbit, I thought. It's weird seeing him like that because we usually see Christopher Lloyd with all that hair and the glasses and all that, but in this movie, he really sold it as Fester. I mean, granted, he, but for the most part, he was playing pretty much as a regular character because if he, it, cause in the movie, he's supposed to be... Is, it's later revealed that he actually is Fester Adams, but he's he's been... It's when they, is he was an orphan, and they found him, and they just... This, the people, the villains in the movie raised him as the, the, well, it's the mother of the movie. Let me restart that again. Okay, let me start again. Uh, the person that raises him uh, basically just raises him as, like, his son, her son. And really, and really, he's actually the part of this family. And most of the movie, he's just playing himself, trying to pretend that he is still Fester Adams. I think more in Adams Family Values, that's where you get to see more of Christopher Lloyd really seeping into the role of Fester Adams, but, I mean, overall in here, he's really good. He does have a lot of the best moments in the film. I mean, the way he saves the day at the end, it's just fantastic. It's hilarious. His acting is great. It's Christopher Lloyd, man. I mean, you can't go wrong with him being in this movie. You also have uh, Christina Ricci. This is one of the movies that really broke her out into a big, into a big star. Uh, this and also Mermaids, and then after Adam's Family Values, that's where she got films like Casper, uh, Gold Diggers, now and then in the '90s, and of course that led to that led to her becoming the star that we know her as today. And um, 
I mean, for a first movie for Barry Sonnenfeld, this is a great start for him. I mean, granted, this movie was originally supposed to be by Tim, by Tim Burton. Tim Burton was actually going to make this movie, but then he dropped out. The, I guess he dropped out at the last minute, so they said, "Let's get this guy. He was never directed the movie." who's never directed a movie before, but we love his cinematography because this is also the same man... Sonnenfeld's also the same man that did the most of the work for the Coen brothers on their early films. And it really shows here how great of a director that he would become in the 90s because, of course, he would later do stuff like uh, Adam's Family Values, Get Shorty, uh, Men in Black, those great movies. Um, and like I said, it's just a great movie all around. I think everything about it really does work. The music overall is great. Mark Shaman, who also did a lot of the music for the South Park movie later on down the year and some other great scores as well, really pr puts the music here to good use. It's a great score by him. And really, it's just a, f it's just a great time all around. Like Even if you're not a fan of the original Adams Family series, you can still come into this movie and just be very impressed by everything that you see here, the visuals in here, I'm amazed at how great they still stand over 30 years later. I mean, most of this is like matte paintings, practical effects for the most part, very rare amounts of CG except for maybe things hand, which is just, which you could tell was just used on a computer to like just take the hand only. And it still holds up to this very day. It's still a very good movie. It's still a well-made film, a really fun film all around. I don't know what else I can say about it. Adam's Family is just a fantastic film. And um, made for a pretty good sequel, too. But uh, we'll get to that one when we get to 93. But in the meantime, let's get to another sequel. This one that came out on this particular weekend. And that is the animated sequel, An American Tale, Five Will Goes West. Well, let's start off with the obvious thing that we need to address. And that is that... An American Tale really didn't need a sequel. I mean, let's be honest. The first movie had a, had a beginning, middle, and end. I mean, it perfectly ended on a good note. They teased a potential... They teased a sequel, yes, but I didn't think they were really ever going to go for it. I mean, it's just like, for the most part, they really had... For the most part, they really had a story that really could have ended with that first movie. But in another way, they, they're trying to read... They're trying to start a new... This was the start of a new animation studio by Steven Spielberg because, of course... Um, uh, he, he had partnerships with Don Bluth and then Disney that didn't work out so well. So, uh, he paired up with Universal, the studio that really launched his career and said, Hey, we're going to give you guys an animation studio. And this is how, uh, the animation studio started off with. And most of their movies came out in the nineties. Most of them were mostly, I won't say forgettable, but they were, they were fun, nostalgic pieces for the time, but they really don't hold up well as movies overall, but but uh, for the most part here, this movie really isn't that... B I'll give it this. It's definitely a major step down from the first American Tale. No doubt about that. But it really isn't the worst movie that... The worst sequel they could have done. I mean, I mean, honestly, I was expecting a whole lot worse watching this one again. But really, there was more about it that I really liked than I would say that I didn't like. I think the animation overall is pretty good. It's interesting because this is the last one to use cell animate one of the last films to use cell animation before we eventually moved into computers doing all, most of the 2D animation for us. And, um, I mean, it does still hold up for the most part, really, when you look back on it. And, um, uh, the voice cast overall is not, not bad. Even though this one, you could tell from the trailer, they were really boasting up this huge voice cast that they had. I mean, you got Dom DeLuise back, you've got, um, John Cleese, Amy Irving, John Lovitz. I mean, you also got Jimmy Stewart in one of his final performances. I think it is, I think it is his final performance, and you know what? Guy put his all into it. I mean, that's really one of the strongest elements about this particular film. But um, what else can I say about this movie? I mean, does it need to exist? No, I don't think it's. I don't think it reaches anything compared to the first movie. But like I said, it's not a bad movie. You can see that there's effort being put in here. It's just that. The story doesn't really work out all that well. Whenever Five was away from his family, it's not a big deal anymore. I mean, that was the main crux of the first movie. Like, his family was literally ready to die to find this to find their kid who got lost at sea. And here it's just like it's a complete afterthought. It just like it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense overall why it, they went with that direction. Not only that, this whole idea of Tiger having to act like a dog to impress this lady cat that she that he falls for—it's just like. 
I don't know. I mean, it's really one of those things that's just like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know what they were thinking on that front. But, um, but like I said, though, it wasn't a bad movie. I just don't think it was a movie that really needed to be made. And it doesn't help that Universal really thought they were going to compete with Disney to put the... Because rem remember, Beauty and the Beast came out on, in wide release on the same day. Even though Beauty and the Beast had opened a week earlier in limited release, they literally put this out on the same day as Beauty and the Beast to compete with Disney. And, uh, like I said, and what do you think happened? Disney beat them to it because Disney made a far superior animated film. But, um... Uh, like I said, this movie wasn't ter like I said the movie wasn't terrible. It just wasn't necessary. I think it was. I think there's more effort into it than it needed to be. But like I said before, I didn't hate it. It's just something that really is very unnecessary. It feels like it kind of feels like a direct-to-video sequel, like the umpteen Land Before Time sequels, except this one was blown up for the big screen. But like I said, it wasn't a bad movie. It's a movie that doesn't need to exist. It's f I guess it's fine for what it is, but. Really, you'd, you'd be better off just watching the first movie and then being done with it overall, at least in my opinion. So, that's my thoughts on American Tale, Five of Goes West. So, uh, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is Bette Mettler and James Caan in For the Boys. Here's another example of an Oscar bait movie that had a good heart to it, but really, it's like I said, it's a simply an Oscar bait movie. It's a movie that is there to just try to win an Academy Award for the people involved. It's directed by Mark Rydell, who also did On Golden Pond, and actually directed Bette Midler earlier in The Rose, which launched her film career. But, um, there's really nothing all that special about this movie. I mean, Bette Midler really is just playing herself. Yeah, Bette Midler really isn't doing a whole lot that really gives her an edge to win the Academy Award. I mean, she's really just playing herself in this movie. Not to say that she's bad or anything, but I don't know. I've seen movies with Bette Midler really acting, and those movies more, I think, deserve deserve better recognition for awards consideration other than this movie. Well, like I said, she's just playing herself in, a, in just another role very similar to what she played in In the Rose. I mean, honestly, if anything, James Caan in particular, I think, really deserves a lot of attention for this because... You know, James Caan had been mostly known for mostly known for like gangster roles, and then at this point, really had not played too many roles out of his normal character stick. But I mean, he plays a pretty good. He's really good in this movie. He's really one of the strongest elements that makes this movie more than watchable. But I mean, for the boys, it's just an okay movie. I didn't hate it. I don't think it's terrible. I don't think it's a really bad Oscar bait movie because there's been so much worse ones that have actually won Best Picture, like King's Speech, Green Book, those type of films. But this movie overall is just okay. I don't think it did anything special to really warrant anything special outside of Oscar consideration for the, for Bette Midler, but even though that, she, like I said, she's really just playing herself, but like I said, it's not a bad movie, but it's one that I was just like, okay, I'm glad I saw it, but I really have no real desire to see this again, so there you go. That's for the boys for you. Let's go on to the next movie, and that is The Double Life of Veronique. Yeah, we're kind of getting into those ones where I haven't seen it. I can't really comment on them too much, but um, I'll give it this, though. Double Life of Veronique doesn't look too bad. I mean, it actually looks pretty good. I do like Christoph Koslowski. I like his some of his other works that he did, including the uh, Three Colors trilogy, Blue, White, right, and Red, which came out a couple years later. I think those movies were pretty good. So, yeah, I'm definitely very curious to check this one out. I like the concept that they have here. I like the story that these two women share the same kind of life that they have. Is even though they don't really know each other all that well. It does sound very interesting, so that's one I'll definitely might check out one day. So that's pretty much all i got to say on that one. So let's go ahead and move on to the last movie that we have here, and that is Young Soul Rebels. So according to Wikipedia, Young Soul Rebels examines the interaction between youth cultural movements during the 1970s in the UK, mo uh, mostly skinheads, punks, soul boys along with the social, political, and cultural tensions between them. And uh, that's pretty much all I know about this movie. Uh, also that Sofia Okonedo, who I've seen in a couple movies in the two th that came out in the 2000s, this was her acting debut. And um, 
yeah, that's really pretty much all I know about this movie. I've never even heard about it until I actually looked it up on here, but, um... Kind of like with Double Life of Veronique, looks promising. Haven't heard too many bad things about it. It actually won the Critics' Prize at the 91 Cannes Film Festival, so... I have no reason to believe it's going to be bad, so... I might check it out one day. It's a definitely look. It definitely looks like a very interesting movie, to say the least, so... So there you go. That's my quick thoughts on Young Soul Rebels. So I was literally about to end the video, and then I realized I forgot another movie that came out on... Well, it didn't really come out this weekend. Here's the thing. Box Office Mojo is screwing around with me again, because... Turns out this movie came out eight weeks ago, and it only took them this weekend to put it into the top ten movies of the weekend. So, here's a movie that was out for a long time, Black Robe. Don't know anything about it, and I've never seen it. I can't really say too much about it, but we're going to try something different here. I'm actually going to put the trailer on right now while I'm recording. So, let's go ahead and do that, and then I'll come back with my quick thoughts on what I think of the trailer. So, let's take a look at Black Robe. So there you go. That's Black Robe. Uh, Bruce Beresford directed it. He also did Driving Miss Daisy. This is actually the fifth film that we've looked at his ever since we started this. And, um, I mean, most of them have been mostly forgettable except for Driving Miss Daisy, which was the Best Picture winner, which I just thought was okay of a movie. This one doesn't, this one kind of looks like it's another one of those Oscar bait type of films. Uh, the only other thing I really know about is that August Schillenberg's in it, and I know him from Free Willy, the Free Willy movies, but that's really all I got for you on this one. I mean, it doesn't look terrible, but it doesn't look like anything I need to rush out and see at any point. But, um, who knows? Maybe I'll check it out one day, but, um, that's really all I got on Black Row for you. <laughs> and now we're finally done with another edition of Time About the Movies. Uh, next time we meet... We'll wrap up November with Thanksgiving weekend, 1991. Luckily, only three movies to look at, including Macaulay Culkin's Return to the Big Screen and My Girl with Anna Chumsley. We also have the Apocalypse Now behind-the-scenes documentary, Heart of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, and also Paper Mass. So we'll look at those three movies next time. With that said, though, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, check out the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you folks tomorrow, and until then, as always, take care.